Turn your spiral books to number seven. <laughs> I am thinking of the rapture in our blessed home on high When the redeemed are gathering in I will raise the heavenly anthem in that city in the sky When the redeemed are gathering in Oh, when the redeemed are gathering in We'll be washed like snow Shout and how we'll sing, Lord, Lord, when the redeemed are gathering in. There will be a great procession over on the streets of gold when the redeemed are gathering in. Oh, what music, oh, what singing, oh, the city will be rolled when the redeemed are gathering in oh when the redeemed are gathering in will be washed like snow and free from all sin oh how we'll shout and how we'll sing Lord, Lord when the redeemed are gathering in saints will sing redemption story with their voices For they cannot join that song When the redeemed are gathering in Oh, when the redeemed are gathering in We'll be washed like snow And free from all sin Oh, how we'll shout And how we'll sing, Lord, Lord When the redeemed are gathering in then the Savior will give orders to prepare the banquet for when the redeemed are gathering in. And we'll hear his invitation, come ye blessed of the Lord, when the redeemed are gathering in. Oh, when the redeemed are gathering in, we'll be washed like snow. Shout and how we'll sing, Lord, Lord, when the redeemed are gathering in. Good afternoon. Uh, would everyone please stand? Um, we have a prayer request from Brother Wade that he and Pop are in Illinois at the church and they're attending this morning. So, um, a new believer took his life, so just pray for their family. A prayer request from June, uh, Brother Cloud Wisinger is in the hospital for a cardiac stent procedure, so just, just pray for him. Um, Danielle's aunt Peggy is in the hospital for miniature strokes at the nine point seven at a high percentage blockage in her carotid artery. So, pray for that. Um, Ezra has a fever, so um, pray for Ezra. And Sister Audrey is having a CAT scan scheduled. Sterling's friend is also struggling with medical issues, so pray for them. 
Brother Ryan has a testimony that Bella and Mike expressed their gratitude for the generous donations made from our church. They are working on getting a house to rent, and then they can receive household items. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm sure all of us have unspoken or prepared requests. Oh, pray for Sister Susan. She's traveling today. Um, pray for Brother Doon and Sister Peggy. He's in terrible pain with his back. He's in terrible pain with his back. And my granddaughter Katie is having surgery Friday to have her gallbladder removed. Okay, remember to pray for that. Um, sure, we all have unspoken prayer requests. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing to gather to worship you in your house, O oh Lord. Thank you for giving us all these things in the world that we do don't really deserve. You're just gracious to us anyways. Remember those traveling, Lord. Remember Brother Wade and Brother Dale in Illinois. And remember the believer who took his life, Lord. Lord, remember all those who are having operations or in the hospital or just have all their minor problems, Lord. We all know that's in your hands. Thank you for blessing all of us and thank you for helping us through our lives. Thank you for all things. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's sing Because He Lives as Sister Anna and Rachel Sunday School class comes up for their special. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He
I've got joy like a fountain. I got joy like a fountain. I got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I got joy like a fountain. I got joy like a fountain in my soul. Let's sing I Surrender All as Sister Monica's class comes up. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior.
I'll pray for the offer. Bow our heads. Dear Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to come here and be together under, you know, your word, Lord, and to learn more about you, Lord. And let's just give back, Lord, for what you've given us, Lord. And we thank you for all the grace you've given us throughout the years and all you've done through, with the forest through our lives, Lord. Just pray for all those who are sick and afflicted, Lord, and just have your way with them, Lord. We thank you for all the things you've done, Lord. Just bless this offering, Lord. Bless the givers, Lord. Bless those who you know, give back to you, Lord, because you've given so much to us. And we thank you for all things. In your precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. In your spiral books to page 540. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. I love you, adore you. I bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Spirit, you're a comfort to me. Holy Spirit, you're a comfort to me. You lead me, you guide me, you're dwelling inside me. Holy Spirit, you're a comfort to me. On the page 575. <clears throat> Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, my Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. shall all pass away but there's something about that name sing it again Jesus 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 there's just something about that name Master Savior my Jesus like the fragrance after the rain Jesus Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but 
there's something about your Sunshine all the way, and oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because He first loved me, it tells of one whose loving heart. Can feel my deepest woe Who in each sorrow bears a part That none can bear below And oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus I'll never forsake him. I'll never forsake him. I'll never forsake him. I'll never forsake him. Because he first loved me. So let's all stand as we change the order of service. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your power and love Holy, 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 I lift it up, 
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. your desire to see you. How many appreciate these young people? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to this, this uh, uh, service every, every month, just seeing all the young people get to sing and, and do it. I appreciate it. Brother Dick, it's so good to see you and Sister Gail. God bless you. It's so good to see y'all here. Like the, the young people were singing about, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with, with all my heart, with all that I am, that, that, with all I am. That's how we should be doing it, right? Amen. Not halfway. I, I think so many today, that we pledge, uh, you know, we kind of give, give things a little bit halfway, kind of withhold a little bit, but we should be giving everything that we have to this gospel. Yeah. So this, morning, this afternoon, I want to talk about a little topic called just the gospel call, which is on my, something been on my heart this week. And, and we'll start off by reading Joshua chapter 23. And then we'll go to Joshua chapter 24. Just to, the first eight verses from Joshua chapter 23 and then Joshua chapter 24. But before we do that, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, I, I'm so grateful, Lord, to be able to come together and look into your word once again, look into the mirror of your word and, and find out what hour we're living in and where we stand, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I, Lord, it's such a privilege to be able to find out whether there be any fault in us or not, or whether we're, we're, we're holding up right with the word, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord Jesus, that you'll just quicken the word to us, Lord God, to be able to realize where we stand this evening, Lord Jesus. And I pray, oh God, that your spirit, Lord, will move up over this congregation, Lord Jesus, as we invite you, Lord, to come in and dwell with us and worship with us, Lord Jesus, and make this not just a, a gathering together, Lord, but a real worship service, Lord Jesus. Because that's what I believe that the bride in this day has, Lord Jesus. Is she's got a real move of the Holy Spirit moving in her, Lord Jesus, moving in the church of the living God to make us something that maybe the world, the world doesn't know anything about, Lord. Lord, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you'll just take the preeminence of this service, Lord God, and open up the word to our hearts. Speak to us, Lord Jesus, in a way maybe that just any man couldn't, Lord God. But we know, Lord Jesus, that the Father draws, Lord Jesus. And I, I know, Lord God, that you'll draw during this service, Lord Jesus. That's what I'm expecting, Lord. I, I come expecting that this won't be just any, old, any regular church service, Lord. But that you'll make it something special. We ask it and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 23 verses 1 to 8 and Joshua said and it came to, came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age and Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them I am old and stricken in age in other words, he's calling all the young folks to gather around to hear a little bit of wisdom from an old person that had been through some, been through some trials. Right. If you remember, when, he went, when they got called out of, out of Egypt, Joshua and Caleb were the only ones to live to see this, this, this part of the journey. So Joshua, he's old and he's been through some stuff, Amen. and he wants to impart a little bit of wisdom to the young folks. And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. <laughs> See, there's another thing. People think that, we're, well, we're just fighting. We're just fighting our, these battles ourselves. You, maybe the young people, the old ones, everybody thinks that you've got a struggle in your life, that you're going to be the one to deliver yourself. But Joshua said, no, it wasn't, it wasn't us. It wasn't by our, by our own doings. It was by the Lord that fought for us. Amen. And he said, Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. 
In other words, he had placed them into their inheritance exactly according to the way that God had thought of it before in, in his mind, in his providence. They had been put into the promised land exactly the way that God had foreordained, even to the way that when they were born, their mama cried out a word of prophecy ex ex exhorting how that they would be placed exactly where they would go. And he's telling them something. He's like, look, you look you're now in the promised land. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight, and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom, therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Be very courageous to keep every commandment, everything that the Lord God has told you to do. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left. That ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make, a mention, make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. Now, cleave don't mean just to, just to you know, go to church and just kind of get around it a little bit. But cleave means like to be vulcanized to it. Cleave means to like that. Remember that one of David's mighty men that grabbed up the sword and he went to fight. And until the sword, his hand clove to the sword, he couldn't let go of the sword because he had fought so valiantly. And that's what I, that's what I believe that he meant with cleave. He means grab a hold of God with all the sinew and don't let go. Now let's go over to Joshua chapter 24, <clears throat> verse 14 to 15. And he says, he's, he, he continues on after he's been exhorting them. And he says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, whether on, on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You may be seated. The Lord had his blessing to the reading of the word. Uh, when, I, when I started preaching, I, I, one, of the, one of these older ministers that pastored another church, he told me, you know, that's where, that's where a minister starts, is as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you, when you make, a, make, a, make a choice, when you make a choosing that your house is going to be the ones that, that is set apart, that, uh, that you have made a, a choice in your mind, that your house is going to be one that serves the Lord, that all the people that live in your house are going to abide by a set of rules that come straight from the Word of God, then that's where, that's where a Christian life really starts. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, maybe I just want to preach on, on, start preaching from this verse here. Choose you. This day whom you will serve, because, you know, every believer has got to come to a place. Every person, Brother Branham taught us, comes to a place where you have a choice set before. You can choose either right or you can choose wrong. You can choose like the Amorite religion, this Moabite religion. You can choose like the Balaamite religion that had been pre presented in front of them. Or you can choose the way of the Lord. You have a right. To, you have, a, uh, you, you have a, uh, these two choices set in front of you, and you have to make a choice. And, and nobody can put that, force you to make that choice. It's all up to you. Your mama and your daddy can't, make you, can't force you to make the choice. Your pastor can't force you to make the choice. It's a choice that you are the, you are the only one that can make. And, you know, I believe that everybody, everybody that comes to church, they want to make a choice. They want to make, let, let's put it like this, they want to make a stand. They want to stand for one thing or another. They want to, they want to stand for what's true, what's right. And I believe that Joshua was well acquainted with taking a stand. And that's why he began to exhort all the, all the young people that were gathered around him about making a stand. Because, you see, he had lived through some things where he had seen people make a stand and he had seen people not make a stand. And so he had come through a place where he knew, he knew the consequences of not making a stand. If you remember when Moses went down into, into Egypt, he, make a, he made a stand by himself. And he made a stand not just upon some intellectual, intellectual conception of God calling him, but he made a stand because he had met God in a burning bush. And he knew who it was that came and talked to him. And he went down to Pharaoh and he said, like, like our pastor has always told us, Pharaoh said, who, who's coming to deliver Israel? Who's coming to deliver these Israelites? And, 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 and Moses answered back, I am. Because he had a personal revelation that God had given 
unto him, and he took a stand. And I believe Joshua remembered as he was speaking to all these young people, he remembered all these times that somebody had taken a stand. As Joshua went out of the children, went out with all of the children of Israel, as he journeyed with Moses, he remembered how all the people began to complain about bread. They began to complain about bread coming down from God out of heaven. And you know, when Jesus was on earth, he said, I am that bread that comes down from God out of heaven. And the people began to complain about it because he didn't come in the way that they wanted it to. And you see people even today in the message around on Facebook and wherever complaining about the revelation of this hour. They don't want revelation anymore. They don't want the word of God in this hour. They'd rather have somebody telling them all about how to live and how to be a good little person and how to be a good moral person. But I believe that what you need in this hour is the revelation of the hour, the revelation of God that he has given us. You know, you can get you can get in your head where you start complaining about coming to church. You can start complaining about, well, I don't want to. It seems so boring and everything. It seems it seems like it's just the same thing rehashed over and over. I've heard that sermon preached before, but you know that's the same thing that the children of Israel did. They began to complain about that bread that God had sent them down from heaven to feed them on the journey, and that was exactly what they had need of. <laughs> I believe it's time to take a stand in this hour. Take a stand for revelation. Take a stand for the word of God that God has given unto us. Because this is the only thing that's going to take us out of here. This is the only thing that combat the devil in this hour. It's the only thing that can give you delivering power in your life. Delivering power over the things of this world. It's the only thing that can give you overcoming power. And that's what I take a stand for. You know, Joshua, when he came to Kadesh Barnea and he saw, he saw all the other Israelites began to to not take a stand. They, they failed to take a stand there when, when God was able to deliver them from the giants. And, and they came to that place. <coughs> Y'all excuse me. They came to that place there at Kadesh Barnea, the great, the great junction time, the great standoff, where only two, Brother Brad, I'm talking about one in a million. And he began to explain how very, very few would go all the way to a real true birth. Very, very few, and he compared it to Enoch and, and Noah, and he compared it to Joshua and Caleb there. Two out of, out of millions that came out of Egypt, just two. Two were the only ones that stood there that took a stand. There were only two that were willing to take a stand at that hour. And you look around and you, you begin to wonder, maybe could it be like that in this day? Maybe could it be like that where so many people come to church, but so many, so few people are willing to take a stand for the gospel Willing to take a stand and say, I believe that God is able to deliver everything, every promise of God. He's able to, able to manifest every single word of God that he's put, put, uh, made ready for this day. Right. And you, see, you see how dangerous it is to not take a stand. Right. To not take a, take a stand for truth. Because every one of them died in the wilderness that were unwilling to take a stand. And so when Joshua began to talk to all these, all these young people, those were the offspring of the ones that had died in the wilderness because they were not willing to take a stand at Kadesh Barnea. And then just as they were about to cross over, so many didn't take a stand against the doctrine of Balaam, which was, we're all the same. We're all the same. There's no difference. And you can see that even in the message play out today. People begin to be deceived and think that everybody's preaching the same thing when everybody is not preaching the same thing. We are not all the same. God, God, is, God is a separator. He is a segregationalist because he takes, he takes the righteous and moves them just like he took the children of Israel and moved them down into Goshen. He separated them from the, from the evil. He separated them from the things of the world. He separated them away and the doctrine of Balaam was that we're all the same. Let's just blend it all together. You can marry a Moabite. You can marry an unbeliever. And they just tried to, he tried to blend it all together until the children of Israel got sidetracked from that. And instead of taking a stand for the word of God, they fell to the deception of Satan's lie. So do you see how important it is to take a stand? Amen. It's important to choose God's word. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And God places it before us. He gives us a choice whether we will choose him, whether we'll choose his word or whether we'll just choose our own ideas, whether we'll listen to the preaching of the gospel or whether we'll just go home and try to figure it out on our own. <clears throat> listen, see, Joshua was speaking to, he was speaking, we'll say he's speaking to a young generation. <sighs> you know, I... I I, I, I agree with the saying, you know, that the young people are the, that they're going to be if the, if the old people, if the, all, all the older ones, if they if they go by the grave, if they if they don't continue on, 
that the young, the, the, all these young people are going to be the next generation. All these young people are going to carry this gospel on. But, you know, the, the, the problem almost I have with saying, look, it's looking to the future. And I, I want to look to today because I believe that the, the young people that are sitting here in this congregation are the generation that is going to see the dead and the dead in Christ rise from the ground. I believe that, you know, if we keep putting it off, putting it off, I believe that you are the generation. I'm speaking to the young people, the old people. I believe that you are the generation that will not prohibit, that will not prevent the, the, the dead in Christ from rising from the ground you are the ones because I believe that you were predestinated to stand and that's what I, I want to identify you tonight I want to declare to you that you were predestinated to stand in this hour and the way that you're going to stand is because you are going to receive the word. You are going to, you have received the word for this hour. You are receiving it. That's why you're here because something is it. There's a desire in you to hear and receive the word. There's a desire in you to serve the word. There's a desire in you to stand for the word. And that's what's going to cause the word to be made manifest in this age. Listen, this is the hour where this layout of see an hour where, you know, every, nobody wants to stand for anything. Everybody, everybody just wants to believe whatever they want to believe. And, you know, I believe young, young people, old people, everybody can get kind of caught up in that mentality that, that whatever I think is what goes. And, and you know, you can, you, 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 so people begin to start thinking, I, I, you know, this is what I stand for. And it, it creates arguments in the home and everything where, where the parents maybe begin to try to lay down the law and lay down standards and everything. And the young people not being born again yet, yet kind of struggling in their own ideas, struggling in their own mind would say, well, this, this is what I stand for. I stand for being able to, to you know, to sleep late. I, I, I was thinking about how Brother Branham, he, began, he was talking about how he was struggling with Billy Paul when he was a young man. He would say, Billy Paul, why can't, why can't you get up earlier before noon? Why can't you get up early before noon? I, you know, Brother Luis was kind of preaching on that this morning. He was touching on that. How about if you consider an ant? You consider an ant, how the ant constantly labors. All the insects that, that you can go outside and see the, the honeybee that's constantly laboring. If you didn't labor, it won't have food in the winter. If an ant doesn't labor, it won't have food. And if you don't, if you don't labor, you won't be able to provide for your family. And you begin to think, well, what I stand for is just being able to do whatever I want. I, I stand for just being able to sleep till noon. I stand for being able... But you know what? That's, that's actually contrary to the Word of God. You know... You see, you see what a danger it is to be able to hold up as the measuring stick for your prosperity, for your success, the measuring stick of your own life. Your own life is not the measuring stick like Zerubbabel that built that temple. Zerubbabel built the temple with a measuring stick of God's word. He held up the measuring stick and measured it and said, if it's not according to God's word, then we got to stop and we got to tear it down. We got to rebuild it again. Right. And so when you, you come to church to hold your life up against the measuring stick, the mirror of God's word, and over time you begin to, you begin to come more and more like the word that you're looking at in the Bible because you're becoming more and more like what you're being measured against. Amen. But it's not yourself that you're being measured against. <sighs> You say, well, you know what? I don't really see anything wrong with the way that, 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 that people say that we should be dressing. I don't really see anything wrong with dressing in this particular way. But God's word says something different. God's word tells you how to dress, how to line up with the measuring stick. God's word tells you how to, how to that, you know, that you should not be corrupting your body. You should not be smoking and, and chewing tobacco and all those different th kind of things. Why? Because it destroys your body. It's destroying you. And so, listen, I, I, I'm talking about taking a stand this morning. You say, why are you, uh, Brother Bob, why are you kind of hitting on all, the, all, all those things? Is that really from the word of God, smoking and drinking and, and, and the way to dress and all those things? If I could turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, where Paul's instructing Timothy. Like Josh was instructing all the young people, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I believe that we're in the last days, don't you? Yeah. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. In other words, just saying, well, whatever I want to do is the right way to do. I don't really care about what the word says. I don't really care about what the Bible says. I don't really care about what the preacher says. You know what? All I care is about what makes me happy. Because if it makes me feel good, if it makes me happy, then that should be something that's all right. And that's what their measuring stick is. And I hope that's not your measuring stick this evening. 
covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Did you know even that being disobedient to parents is in the Bible? Disobedient to parents? When, when you've got real godly, a real godly mother and father that's trying to raise you up, and, and, and in your mind you think that you know better. Now listen, I, listen I, I'm going to just, just speak frankly. I, I wonder sometimes if the young people really know how much the, old, the older ones love them. How much, I, I've seen people around this church, the older ones, weeping and sobbing because they're concerned about their young people. They want their young people to be saved. Yeah. I wonder if the young people really realize what a burden that is on the people's heart for you to be saved. I wonder if you realize with what agony or what grieving the people are calling out to God in the middle of the night on their night bed crying at night for you to be saved. I want to just call your attention to that. See, one day, one day I believe the young people, many young people will turn around and, like I did. I know I did. Turn around and be, I, I wish I hadn't acted like that when I was young. I wish I hadn't acted all silly and everything like that. Uh, disrespectful. Unthankful, unholy, Paul says, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of God in us, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Denying the power thereof. What kind of power is there in the gospel? There's a kind of power that can take you from loving yourself and loving your brother and sister. There's a kind of power that can take you from being subservient to the things of the world and giving you power over the world. There's, there's a kind of power that can give you power over that devil that you struggled with all your life. And you can turn around and see it washed away in the sea of forgetfulness, washed away in that Red Sea, just like all the Egyptians that were destroyed as the Israelites crossed over. That's the kind of power I'm talking about. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Listen, I'm talking about a power that can make you not be ashamed of the way that your mama has a bun. I can make a kind of power that can make you not be ashamed of your mama wearing a long dress. Going to make you not be ashamed of the way that Christians around you talk and act and things. I'm talking about a power where you know that God is real and God is alive today. Because he's living in his church, he's living in his people, and he can live in you too. Listen, we, we try to, we get to a place where we think, well, I, I like this particular kind of music and therefore it must be right. But God can change your desire for music, a desire from a kind of music that glorifies the flesh, that glorifies the person, that glorifies the creation and, and turns your desire to a kind of music that glorifies the creator. Right. Yes, he can because yeah, heaven and earth will pass away. But you, you know, the music, the music CDs and all, all the iPods and all that will return to dust. All this beauty of movie stars and everything, well, that'll, that'll just begin to sag and droop. Yeah. But satisfying the flesh will lead you down a road that you don't want to go. Where you become a prisoner to the devil, but the power of the gospel can take you to a life eternal that never passes away. Right. That never dies, that never goes away. Yeah. And by faith, Moses, Brother Branham said, but you got to choose. You got to choose. And don't look at what you see. Choose what you see by faith. Amen. That's the only thing that will count is what you choose by faith. Yes. Lot as he had to make a choice. Abraham give Lot his choice. And God gives you your choice. Right. Choose you this day who you shall serve. In the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of knowledge and a tree of life. Man was given the privilege to choose either one he desired and so is it today. You're given your privilege as free moral agents to choose whatever you want to choose. Right. And I say tonight, choose based upon God's word. Amen. How will you know the right way to choose if you don't know God's word? If God's word says don't do it, then don't do it. If God says do it, then do it. If God's, well, listen, if God's word says to come to church, then you should be at church every, sing, every single time the doors open. And that's something we struggle with. We say, well, well, what will my family think? My family might be offended if I don't come to church. Uh, listen, the three Hebrew children did not care about 
the, anybody else being offended when they said, we will not bow down to the image that you have erected up to the prophet of our day. Because remember that Brother Brown said that image that was erected, that was an image of Daniel. The image to the prophet of their day, they would not bow down to it. And when they said, maybe when they're saying in this day, bow down to the image that has been erected to the prophet of our day. Do you care what other people think? Do you care what your family thinks? When you say, I will not bow down. Because listen, Whenever you make a stand, it always causes conflicts. Yeah. Conflict. Right. Whenever you make a stand, when a father makes a stand in his home, it, it'll cause conflict. A lot of times it causes conflict and until, you know, people begin to wonder, well, why, why is it suddenly when a man gets saved, when a woman gets saved, why is it suddenly wrong for you to, to do this? Why is it suddenly wrong for there to be mixed bathing? Why is it suddenly wrong for you to dress in this particular way? Why is it suddenly wrong for this and that and the other? And it causes conflict. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. I think sometimes we forget that. But I, for I am come to set a man at various against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. But I, I don't want that. I want there to be peace and everything. And what that means is that you're not willing to take a stand. You're not willing to take a stand for the gospel. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, well, well the young people can't make a stand if, uh, if their parents haven't been living right. I remember the story in the Bible of Josiah who was crowned when he, I believe he was about eight years old. And his father had been living wrong. His father had been living evil. But when he was crowned, when they put that crown upon little Josiah's head, he began to say, he, put, he, he began to possess in his heart a desire to live true to God and began to tear down all the altars that they had erected to Baal. He began to tear down everything that they had erected. And I believe a young person in this day, in this hour, when they hear the truth coming across the pulpit, they can go home and they can take their daddy's pornographic magazines and throw them out of the house. They can take all the filth that their mama's been living, all that, all that makeup and everything, and throw it out of the house. When you hear the gospel for yourself, you can live it whether or not whether or not it, maybe anybody else has even been living around you because it's a personal experience Amen. you've got to choose for yourself Amen. you've got to be the one choosing Amen. you've got to choose right and wrong Amen. now I'm gonna flip flop a little bit so hang on because <laughs> it's not really you that does the choosing you do the accepting. Right. Listen, I, I was talking to, talking to my kids after they get back from camps, and, they, and I'm not bashing necessarily. This is a problem all across life, not just the camps. But you see all these, these little girls, they, they, want, they, want to, they want to be the one to choose a, a boy. And they go taking their cell phone, and they go running all over the place. Take my number, call me, get my Instagram or whatever. And you see that's backwards. That's the, I, I, listen, if nobody else has ever told you that before, I'm telling you. Right. I, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to preach it. <laughs> because, listen, listen, uh, the man is the one that chooses. The man in the gospel is the one that chooses. Right. Right. Yeah, even in the gospel, the people are always running. People, just like Adam in the garden, he was the one running. And, and the man, Christ Jesus, was the one that chose. Christ Jesus is the one that came running after him. He was choosing him. He wanted him. He was looking at his character. He was looking, I want you. And look, that's the way a man, that's the way any man wants to choose a bride. That's the way any man, a real man, wants to choose a wife. Is he's looking for character. He's looking for, he's not looking for just some kind of, some kind of shapely something that can walk in a particular way to satisfy the lust of the flesh. He's not looking for somebody that just tinkles on her, on her high heel shoes going this way and that. But he's looking for character. And that's the same thing that God is looking for in you. He's looking for character. Why do you think that Ahasuerus chose Esther when she presented herself without any costly apparel, without all pearls and all kind of dolled up with makeup and everything? But he said, I see in you something priceless. I see a real character in you. And that's why she was chosen to be his queen. God is the one that does the choosing. God is the one that does the choosing, you see. He's the one that's knocking at the door of your heart. 
And listen, you either you either accept or reject. You are the one that says, yes, I'll open it up or I will shut the door. You are the one that accepts, the one that is choosing, the one that is choosing you. And we'll get to how he chooses in a minute because you're chosen in him. You've been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But I just want to talk about another example in the Bible. Remember when, when, when Isaac began, Isaac, the man, he began to want, oh, oh, I need a wife. And so this story is very, very different than the way that it normally works. He, he sent somebody else, so it looked like somebody else to go find him a wife. Yeah. He sent Eliezer, the, the messenger, just like the prophet in this day. You didn't hear it straight from Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's lips. You heard it from a prophet messenger's lips, yeah. just like Rebecca heard it from Eliezer's lips. But you can see how even in this situation, as Eliezer went up to, how am I going to find a wife for my, for my master? Yeah. How am I going to find? You can see the spirit of the living God moving upon the scene. Yeah. And this, this is what I want to get to tonight. It's God's spirit drawing you. Listen, a man can get up behind a pulpit and preach a good sermon. But unless God comes and draws and, and speaks to your heart, you'll just sit there like a rock on a log. Yeah. You'll just sit there like a toady frog. You won't make more, one move, but when God begins to speak to your heart, yeah. something's got to happen. Uh, and you can see, let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 24. As Eliezer will begin to, begin to cry out to God, he said, Behold, I stand here by the well of water. Isn't that interesting that Jesus... So, so many women in the Bible w met the Savior in a well of water. I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher. I pray thee that I may drink and she shall say drink and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass before he had done speaking, before he had done speaking, the Holy Spirit was already working on the scene. Hey, right, right. The Holy Spirit was already moving on her, moving on this predestinated bride of Isaac to come and fulfill prophecy. You say, Brother Bob, what's that got to do with your sermon? I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving in this congregation right now, moving to fulfill prophecy. You are, you are fulfilling a vision. You are in a vision right now. You are fulfilling the word of God right now because I believe that God, that same spirit that moved on Rebecca, I believe that that same spirit is right now in this building speaking to your heart, moving upon your subconscious, moving upon your secret desires, causing you to realize, speaking back that that is the truth. That's nothing but the truth. Behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, I, I wonder if he was sitting there thinking, well, the, what's going to happen next? Will the rest of my petition be fulfilled, even in my sight? Will the rest of it be, be made manifest? And she, then she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And I know it's been illustrated many times how much a camel drinks. Do you see how, how amazing this was for her to say, I will water your camels also? Because a camel, you don't just give it a glass of water. You just don't just even pull up one bucket full. But listen, a very thirsty camel may drink up to 32 gallons of water in 13 minutes. Another, and, and think about that long line of camels. In other words, this was something miraculous that was taking place. This was something amazing that was taking place. He didn't just ask for some little piddly thing. Like, like, listen, a, a lot of the young people today, they want to put all of their marriage on some little piddly thing that they, well, I had this little piddly dream. I had this little something. And you don't base anything upon the word of God. You don't, you don't go back to the word to see whether or not you should be getting married or not. And listen, I've had that thrown up in my face. I know, a lot of you know my testimony, how I did have a dream before I saw my wife. I saw my wife in a dream. And I'm not saying that to make anything of myself. I'm saying it to lay the back record, to put the record straight. Because I did not go to my wife and say, listen, I had a dream. Now you got to marry me. Listen, look, dangle that dream all in her face like that. Listen, I had a dream. See how spiritual I am? Look at this. I believe that God can direct your path. But he don't direct your path so that you can go manipulate somebody like that. 
He don't go do that so that you can just dangle it in front of somebody so you can say, show how spiritual and how great you are. Listen, there is a real true call of God in people's life. There is real, a real move of the Holy Spirit in God's life. And if God really does show you by revelation who you should marry, then you hang on to that and hold it down in your heart. And do like Eliezer and said, if it is true, then God will bring it to pass. And if it is not true, then maybe God, maybe, maybe God didn't show me that. Think of it that way. But listen, I've seen so many, so many situations. I, I, listen, I was talking to a, a pastor of another church. I'm going to just put this out there. And he said, he said, I've had so many men come up to my daughters and say, God showed me in a dream that I should be marrying you. And he asked one of them, how many other girls did you tell that to? And he said, seven. Seven that you told that God has spoke to you and told you to marry, marry my daughter. Listen, oh, I, whoa, are we majoring in a bunch of foolishness? There's so much foolishness going on. I would encourage you to be wise in the gospel. Be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Gird up your loins to know whether what's truth and what's a lie. Listen, I just about come to where, listen, if nobody else will say it, I'm, I'm fixing to just lay it out there. I believe that you need to sit down with your kids and lay it out there so that they know what's truth and what's right. Lay it out there so that they're not led astray by all kinds of gobbledygook and all kinds of nonsense, all kinds of filth and perversion that people, some, some young man that's not even filled with the Holy Ghost, all he's got on him is, is some lustful spirit comes sniffing around your girls and everything and, and wanting, to, wanting to come up and... Uh, <sighs> Listen, it's, it's, time, it's time to be real. Amen? Right. It's time to be real. It's time to stand for something. It's time to stand for truth. Amen. It's time to stand for something that's real in this hour. Amen. That's right. Amen. But look, see, see how I was saying earlier on that you got to, it's time for you to take a stand. It's time, and, and, and you can't make the right stand without God moving on you, moving on you to, to do that. I think so many times, you know, it frustrates us parents and everything. We'll, we'll start fussing and everything about why are you listening to that music? Why are you doing such a thing? Why do you, do you not understand why you should not dress this particular way? Do you not understand all these things? But you cannot understand Unless it's revealed, because it's sovereignly revealed. You cannot understand unless the Spirit of God comes and speaks to you. And that's why in John chapter 6 45, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Every man that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. Uh, and you know, I, I think sometimes we get us in our, in our head when we, when we read this scripture that no man can come to me except the Father hath sent, which hath sent me, draw him. Don't, no man can come. We look at that as a negative thing. No man, well, I may as well not even try. No man can come. But do you, I, I want to flip that around and look at it real positive this evening. Because if that means that no man can come unless the Father draws him, then that means that when a preacher gets up behind the pulpit and something goes to whirring in your heart, when you hear a going in the mulberry bush, that's not because of the preacher that's drawing you, but that's because of a living God that's speaking to your heart. I want to identify that for you tonight, that when the preaching goes forth and something in your heart says that's the truth, that's the truth, open up the door of your heart. That's the living God moving upon, the, moving upon your heart. I wonder, all, all of you older ones that have been born again, if you could look back this morning and remember when God first began to draw at your heart. Right, <laughs> I remember when he first began to draw at mine. Listen, I, I grew up in a message home. I grew up, I, sit in a, I sat in a message home. I, I, we had tapes playing all the time. I remember where, <coughs> I remember when my dad would go out and get the tape boxes that were shipped every once a month or however often they were. And with joy, he would open up the tape and put the tape in and, and open up the books and sit there reading for hours. But do you think I did? Do you think I wanted to do that? No, because the Father had not drawn me yet. 
And I would sit there at, when we went on long car rides and, the, and my parents would constantly be playing the tapes. We would have devotionals every night in my home when my parents would sit around and talk to us and read stories from the Bible and explain to us every single night. And that's one thing where I've liked growing up. As, as I've called it, find it kind of falling short, to be honest. I, 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 my, but my dad did it every single night when we were on vacation, when we were at my grandma's house, every single night he was constantly having devotionals. But do you think I ran headlong after the gospel? Not until the father drawn me. But one day I was walking with my dad as we went after, after church. We were walking down this, this, uh, through the wheat fields as they were growing. I believe it was wheat. It was some kind of crop. And he began to talk about the future home of the heavenly bride and the, the, the heavenly bridegroom and the earthly bride. And he began to talk about that. And, and, and it wasn't just the words that he said, but something began to speak down on the inside of my heart. And when I got home, I could not put down the tapes. I could not put it down. I, I ran headlong to the message. I was talking to another brother years ago where he was testifying of how when he heard that call, he said, I read the entire Bible in a weekend. The entire Bible in a weekend. Listen, that's, that's, that's running like Elijah after Ahab's chariots. Yeah. The entire Bible from cover to cover. Why? Because something had got a hold of him. And it wasn't just a preacher from behind the pulpit, but it was a living God. And that's what I want to get to you tonight is that there is a living God moving. There are angels encamped around about us that you can't see. There's a living God speaking to your heart right now. And he's calling from an unseen realm. He's calling you to look, look past the things that you see. Look past the things that your two eyes can behold. And look past. Look to see what God has waiting for you. He's calling. He's drawing. You see, because that's how, that's how he's done everything. Remember Paul in the Bible. Paul ran. He, he, thought, he thought he was doing the right thing by running after Stephen and killing him, by, by persecuting Christians, by running after him. But then one day, and listen to how it has worded in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 30, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 9. And he said, in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, and he said, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's hard for thee to kiss, kick against the pricks. Who are you? Who was pricking him? Who was pricking Paul? Was it, was it Stephen so much when he saw him dying there? No, it was, a, it was a spirit of a living God speaking to his heart, pricking him. But listen to what they said on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 and 37. Therefore, and Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And right while all around about him, all the Pharisees and Sadducees were standing there, well, I don't see nothing special about this. But they were pricked in their heart. Why? Because the Father had spoken to them. It was God on the inside calling to them. God revealing to them that there's something real about this. When they began to realize that these, are, these men aren't drunk with wine, there's some kind of supernatural stimulation. There's something supernatural going on, and God spoke down on the inside of their heart, this is true, this is real. That's right. <coughs> Where's he calling from? He called, he called Saul by name. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul, Saul. Do you know what? He's calling you by name tonight. He's calling you by name because when you, when you hear that gospel call, and by the gospel call, I'm not just talking about a preacher from behind the pulpit, but I'm talking about the Spirit of God calling your name. He's calling from eternity because he knew why he knew you before the foundation of the world. He knew you. He saw you. He knew that you would be sitting in this service tonight. He knew whether you would be asleep or whether you would be awake. He knew whether your ears would be open. He knew whether you would be receptive. He knew whether you would want it or not. And so it was predestinated in him before the foundation of the world. And that's how you were chosen in him. You were chosen in him. He chose Christ Jesus. And because you were in him before the foundation of the world, he also chose you. You were chosen in him. 
Well, how were you chosen in him? Because in John chapter 12, 32, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. All men. What kind of men? In Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27, it said, God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And you were there back then. You were there as an attribute back then, and he knew you. You were predestinated in him before the foundation of the world so that when he died on the cross, he could look forward in time and know that one day you would receive it like he prayed for you in John chapter 17. Like in John chapter 12, it says, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And now he's drawing you, you that were predestinated to hear this gospel before the foundation of the world. He's drawing you to himself. He's drawing you back to the eternal. And how is he drawing? Because when you hear the preaching of the gospel, then, and the preaching of the gospel is true. When truth is preached, the, the Spirit of God can hover over that word, hover over you and say, and point back to that and say, that's the truth. And Brother Branham, it will be said, the, the response will be just as simple as just raising your hand. Will you raise your hand? All the people in the congregation that he, Brother Brandon would be talking to, stand up from your seat, raise your hand, all of those things, because, listen, See how you cannot raise your hand without something spiritual taking place. Right. Why? Because Ezekiel chapter, uh, Ezekiel chapter, I believe it's 30, 36, says that you've got a stony heart. He's got to soften up your heart so that he can, he's got to soften up your heart by the revealing of the word. And without a soft heart, you just sit there all stony faced. Like, like, a, like a little toady frog on a limb. You just sit there staring at the preacher. But when God begins to move upon you like he moved upon the water in Genesis, when he moved upon the water and caused that sea, that predestinated sea that had been laying there, Brother Adam said, from another civilization, uh, an eternal civilization, when that spirit of God began to move upon that seed, the seed came up. And that's what he's doing now. He's moving upon that a predestinated seed in your life. And he's going to cause it to come up. He's causing it to come up from the mud and the muck and the mire until there's a birth that takes place because <sighs> what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having pre predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will he's chosen us in him My, that should make every believer so happy today that should make every believer so happy to realize that God has spoken to you on a one-to-one -one basis. Amen. He came down. He saw so much of you. He valued you so much that he sent his spirit into the church so that he could speak to you, so that he could commune to you. I, I, you know, they were talking about that young man that just killed himself up there. I, 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 I wonder... you. You, you want to just get across to all the young people, all the people in the world. If you could realize with what value you have, yeah. the value, you, your soul is worth 10 billion, 10 billion, trillion worlds. Right. Right. Your soul is worth that much to God. And God is worth so much that he came down and died for you and died for you so that he could send his spirit back on the day of Pentecost and speak to you and commune you, with you on a one-to-one -one basis. Amen. That's how much God cares for you. But you see with the devil... The devil tries to get in there and tell people that they're worthless and they don't have any value and, and all that kind of thing, so and all kind of discord like that. Oh, brothers and sisters, constantly tell, the, tell your children, constantly tell your young people how much you love them. Be salty to them. Be so salty to them that it'll make them thirsty. Be salty to one another. That will, uh, don't, don't let the salt lose its savor. Be so salty and sweet and wonderful and kind to one another that it'll make everybody just long to be a Christian. Everybody long to have what you got. Yeah. That's, that's my prayer for myself. Uh, you know, I know many times that I've fallen, I've failed, I've failed at that. I've failed as a father so many times. But listen, the mistakes that we made, many times we make mistakes raising our children. Many times we make mistakes, but there is a God that can come upon the scene just like Josiah that was raised wrong. And he can patch everything up and make all things new. He can, he can straighten everything up. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe sometimes it's good for the, for the young people to see mistakes in our lives, to realize that there's no good in us. Just because people, people think, well, the, you're a minister, you must be all perfect and everything. Listen, ministers have more problems than anybody else because the devil, I, I won't say more problems, but 
The devil's got all of his guns trained on you to constantly hinder you so you can't study and things. I, talking about, my, my, you hear about all these pastors all around that the devil will try to attack their kids and get, get them running off to get married and all these kind of things. Listen, we should be praying one for another, praying one for another diligently. I don't know why I got off on that, but anyway. <laughs> Listen, let's just, it's been 45 minutes, so I'm, I'm trying to come to a close here. You think about all the ones in the scripture that, that didn't know hardly anything about the gospel. And maybe their hearts were cold. But then God came on the scene to begin speaking down on the inside of this, speaking to them, revealing himself to them. Calling them. Just like little Mary, little 16 year old Mary, one day she was walking just do about her own business and, and an angel came to deliver her a message that, and he began to expound to her about how Isaiah, Isaiah had prophesied that a virgin shall conceive. And she said, Well, how, how is this going to be? And he said, Well, well, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And see, she heard a message. She heard the message from the angel. But you see, it takes the spirit of God to come and speak to you. That's right. It takes the spirit of God to come and quicken it. Without the spirit, I was talking about in Sunday school this morning, without the Holy Ghost, we're, this is just a gathering. Right. Without the Holy Ghost, and, and many times you can, you can begin to just look at the natural and you begin to lo lose sight that there is a Holy Ghost moving in the church. Maybe, maybe sometimes many uh, uh, ministers, as they stand from behind the pulpit, you begin to look out to people, as Luis was, was expounding this morning, and, and see people s seem like they're not desperate anymore. Their, their eyes are half closed. They can barely stay awake. Right. And, and it seems like they don't even really want it anymore. Yeah. There, is there any uh, hunger for the gospel anymore? And you begin to, in the natural, in the natural, you begin to think, well, maybe nothing's going on. But realize that, that God, that Hebrews 13, 8 says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And that God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is still moving in his people. He's still working. He's still doing things. Amen. He's still calling his people. That's right. <clears throat> you see, it's not the preacher drawing you, though. It's not the preacher. It's the Holy Ghost that's doing the drawing. Amen. Remember in 1 Ch Samuel right. chapter 2, it says, uh, uh, talking about how that that, that little Samuel lay in there at night when the Spirit of God came and began to minister to him. And it says, And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And do you see what Samuel thought it was? He thought, he thought it was the priest. He thought it was the priest drawing him. And that's what I, I want to call to your attention, identify. When you, when you get a little idea, uh, something begins to stir down on the inside of your heart, that's, that's God speaking to you. And, and the only thing for you to do is just quickly run and respond. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not, lie down again. And he went and lay down, and the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he answered, I call not, my son, lie down again. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, just like so many of us, the first time we heard God. So maybe we need a little bit of extra instruction. And maybe that's why I'm preaching this tonight, to identify the Holy Ghost calling you. When the Holy Ghost is speaking to you, that's the Holy Ghost revealing to you, trying to come in, knocking on the door of your heart. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And, and Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Because you see, it's the Lord calling you. In the conference with God in 1960, Brother Adam said, Talk it over with him tonight. Friend, just a few words will mean so much. Let's bow our heads just a moment now. I'd like for each one of you to think in your heart, Am I worth anything? Sure you are. God loves you. Look what he gave for you. Oh, how do I know he will receive you? The very thought of you recognizing that you're wrong is the facts that Christ is dealing with you. He said, no man can come to me except my father draws him first. That shows that God's right near you, drawing you. He wants to hold a little conference with you there in your seat or standing around in the aisle. 
in the wall or outside, leaning against the building or out in your cars. The Holy Spirit. Oh, I know it seems simple. I've heard that before you, but it's the truth. He wants to hold a little conference with you now and just talk it over with you. I wonder if you've ever had a little conference with God before. I think that's one thing that may be so lacking in so many of our lives. I tell you, that's one thing that's been lacking in my life. Because you get so concerned with all the things around you. You get so concerned with your job or how long it takes to get to work and everything that you forget to to commune with God and, and forget that he's drawing you. But listen, you know, you know, that's why people, people get in their head. Well, this church, Brother Dale and Brother Wade and everybody, they're, they're against altar calls. They're against people coming up and giving their life to the Lord. No, nobody's not against giving their life to the Lord. Right. Nobody's against altars, against altar calls if it's the man drawing you. If it's the man saying, come up trying to pluck away at your emotions and things. Well, 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 well don't you think you, you saw your brother or your sister come up the other day or whatever it might be. Well, don't you think you ought to come up now too? And you see what it ends up doing is it doesn't do anything. Yeah. People get this miscon- misconceived notion of what, what it really is to come to the Lord. They think they begin to think like Samuel did, that it was the priest drawing them instead of waiting on, waiting on God to do the drawing. But you see, we believe in altars. We believe, we believe like Abel back in the, well, Brother Bram explained it, he, he put himself on that altar with his sacrifice and identified himself with that lamb that he offered up. He put himself on that altar and he died himself. And I believe in a dying out, whether it's in your car, whether it's in the, uh, on the bus to work, whether it's, whether it's in your pew at church, I believe in a dying out. But it's got to be God that does the drawing. Yeah, right. You remember how Brother Branham began to, uh, he, he kind of got on one of his deacons when, when he, he went up to Brother Billy Paul after Billy Paul had gone through all that trial of gambling and all, that, all the different things that he got, up, all, got involved with. And the deacon went up and kind of tapped him on the shoulder, don't you think? It's time, don't you think you need to be up there at the altar when the, when the Spirit of the Lord was moving? And Brother Branham came by later and he said, you can't do that. You can't just, you can't, you can't force anybody in any way because then it's the priest, then it's the person, then it's the man. It can't be the man. It's got to be God doing the drawing because then when it's God doing the drawing, it's something real. It's something real like we were talking this morning about in, 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 in Sunday school. What, yeah, Sunday school. <laughs> what is the Holy Ghost? The real baptism of the Holy Ghost is a personal revelation of Jesus Christ personal to you. And that is the calling of God. That is the drawing of God. God revealing himself to you. He reveals himself to you that he has justified you. He reveals that you need something wrong in your life. He reveals that you need to be sanctified. And he reveals to you that you can be sanctified. And you begin to feast on the word and you begin to eat the word and he begins to reveal it to you until it pushes out and pushes out. But it's not the man behind the pulpit and it's not your mama and daddy. It's God doing the drawing. It's God doing the revealing. And then it becomes something real, you see. Then it becomes something somebody, nobody can take away from you because it's God on the inside doing the work. Amen. <clears throat> you see, Psalm 42, 7 says, deep. Brother Brown used to always, he, he preached on this so many times. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouse. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. You ever, you ever experienced that where you just get in the presence of the Lord so much until he's just wafting over you and he's speaking to you and, and communing with you and you know what it means to have a deep calling to your deep, a deep, the soul of God in communion with your soul, something, something drawing you, something speaking to you, something. And you know what that does? It puts you, it puts you into a state of desperation. Because listen, I'll be closing on this in a minute. Let me just bear with me just a moment because I got to get this out, y'all. When God begins to speak to you, when God began to speak to me as I was walking with my dad, it put me into a state of desperation that there's something out there that I don't have that I need. It made me thirsty. It made me realize what that thirst was all of a sudden. And the only way to quench that thirst was to get into the word, to get into fellowship with God, to pray and seek him, to long for him, to get into communion with him. It made me desperate. And listen, you see, you can preach a sermon about you need to be desperate. You need to be desperate and you do need to be desperate, but it's only God that can make you desperate. 
But when God begins to draw at you and begins to pull at you, it's time to let go and get, get real. It's time to it's give, give over to that desperation. Because Brother Branham taught us that when, when you begin to get desperate, that's when things happen. Something begins to take place when you, when you begin to get desperate. And I'm not, you know, Brother Bob's talking about getting the new birth. No, I'm talking about this whole journey. When you begin to see the statue of a perfect man and you realize that there's something lacking in your life, something more beyond, something greater than just the new birth, then I believe it should create a desperation in you. If it's really God calling you, if it's really God drawing you and not just somebody drawing it out on a whiteboard, not just somebody explaining it to you so you say, well, good, I've got that now from an intellectual standpoint. I've got it good laid out for me. But when God does the drawing, when God begins to reveal himself for you, it puts you into desperation. Why? Because you're desperate for the word. Amen. <sighs> Brother Brown said in desperation, he said, you can't be desperate till God speaks to you. Oh, church, rise and shake yourself. Pinch your conscience. Wake yourself up in this hour. We must be desperate or perish. Yes. There is coming forth something from the Lord. I know it as thus saith the Lord. There is coming forth something, and we better get desperate. It's between life and death. It'll pass through us, and we won't see it. Hey, you know, I, I believe maybe sometimes it kind of hinders people when, when ministers get to preaching about desperation. It kind of, well, don't you think I'm desperate enough for whatever? Don't you think maybe you don't see the way that I pray and agonize? And many times we don't. But I believe many times preachers are like Joshua and Caleb when they began to stand up there as, as they saw the people unwilling to make a stand. And what did they do? They began to rend their clothes. And I believe that's what the ministry of the gospel around the message is doing in this hour is they're rending their clothes in desperation. It's time to get desperate. It's time to pay, take a body change. Do you think you'll take a body change without getting desperate? Do you think you'll take a body change with just going along haphazardly like Brother Luis was preaching this morning? Yeah, listen, listen, that was a masterpiece this morning that he preached because he was talking about the lackadaisical layout of sin spirit that grabs a hold of so many and you just go floating away down the river, floating away without getting desperate. But I believe the gospel was sent in this day to make you desperate, to realize that something's got to take place. you got to be like that little chicken hatching out of the egg, like a little eagle. We'll say an eagle. Brother Brown told the story about the little chick hatching out of the egg, but I'm going to say an eagle. An eagle hatching out of the egg, that it's, it's desperate to break through. It's desperate to get through that thing. And he said that little, that little uh, eagle, a little chicken, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's laboring and it's pushing, trying to get through. And you know what? You can't help it. You can't help it because it'll kill it. What, is, what does he mean by you can't help it? You can't do it for it. You can't do it for your kids. You can lay it in front of them. You can lay the gospel in front of them, just like the ministering of the gospel is laying it in front of the people. But I can't make anybody live the gospel. Like you've heard the story that's saying about you can put lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can lay the gospel in front of somebody, but it's only God that can draw them to it. It's only God that can draw them to make it to, to drink. And listen, you are, God is drawing you through a process, and you're laboring to bring forth life, laboring. Like, remember the story of Hannah, how she began to cry. She didn't have a son. She wanted to see that promised son come forth. She wanted to see a child come forth. And she began to call out for God when they went, when her husband went down to do his duty as a priest. She went into the temple and, 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 and lay there before the altar. And she began to call out to God. Why? Because there was something that she knew she didn't have and she needed. And I believe that's how every, every young person, every old person in, this, in the entire world, in, the, in this church today should be. You should realize if there's something that you don't have, call out to God until God comes upon the scene and delivers that son into you. Amen. <coughs> Everybody all right? Amen. Brother Ram said in birth pains, he said, Lily, he said, consider it how it grows, toils, has to bring itself up. This little pond, Lily, where it, where it come through, dirt, muck, mud, muddy waters, dirty waters, it pressed its way through all of that. This little germ of life working itself from the bottom of the pond where the frogs and things are at, and then brings itself up through all of that. But when it gets in the presence of the sun, it's born. 
the little seed bursts open into life. It cannot do that until it goes through all that process. It's got to come through that. That's what makes it is because that the sun itself is what's drawing it. The sun itself is what's drawing the life in that seed. And when it gets fully above all the dirty waters and muck and so forth, then it's so happy. It just gives its life out freely. And it's a beautiful life when it gets to the presence, in the presence of that which is drawing it up. I think that's a beautiful type of Christian life. When something is drawing you out of the world until one day you're born right into its presence by the Holy Spirit. How beautiful. If you try to help it, you kill it. Like a little chicken when it's being born. You know, if you'd ever notice one of the little fellows right on top of his little beak or any bird that's born from an egg, it's, got, it's maturing this old eggshell. The old inner parts of the eggs has to rot away. And it has to take this little beak and scrape back and forth until it breaks the shell out. We call it pipping its way out down in Kentucky where I come from. Pipping its way out. They have never found a better way. See, you try to help him, you'll kill him. Pick the shell off of him, he'll die. See, he's got to labor, strain, break forth. You see, that's what's happening in the church now is that the church is laboring, breaking forth, laboring to bring forth the promised son. And many, many in this church are at different stages of labor. Some are laboring to just push through that, through that, little, that first little layer of dirt into the sun. And some are laboring to push forth and bring forth that adopted son, that adopted child, yeah. the birth of the son of man. Yeah. Different ones at different stages of labor, but we're all laboring. But I want to encourage you tonight. And I, I, see, that's what makes it so difficult to preach. I can't make anybody desperate, but yet I'm going to, be, I'm going to preach desperation. Yeah. You must be desperate. You must be desperate in this hour. Now is the hour of desperation. Uh, see, I'm so tired of hearing excuses. Well, we can't get desperate until persecution comes. I believe that if you get along with God a little bit, if you'll get into the Word and begin to look into the mirror of God's Word long enough, it'll create a desperate longing in you Amen. to see God's Word fulfilled in you. Right. I believe that. I believe that that's what that's what the message of the hour calls for. Yeah. Desperate. If if not, why did Brother Branham preach desperation? Why did he preach birth pains? I believe that it calls for something else other than just kind of coming along, coasting along, coming to church, just kind of being lackadaisical. And, and that's, why, that's why in the book of Revelation it says he'll spew you out of his mouth if you're neither hot nor cold, just kind of lukewarm. Yeah. Just lukewarm enough to just, uh, well, I, I kind of, I'm here. I'm kind of doing it. I, 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 I know about the message, so I must believe it. But get into the message until it becomes a living reality to you. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm telling about my personal walk. I, I told you about how when, I, when the Lord began to first call me, when the Lord go, gave me the Holy Ghost, when the Lord filled me with power, I, I remember the first thing that I thought of, of when I got, I, I was reminded of how Brother Bram said, very, very few will go all the way to receiving the new birth. Very, very few. And you think, well, that, that means very few will go all the way to receiving it in that moment. Listen, friends, I, I hate to sound negative, but I believe, I believe that things are proven out that very, very few have gone on to receive a real born-again experience. Yeah. Not just talking about adoption, but a, just a baby form born-again experience. And so I want to encourage you. I, I, I want to lay it out before you. It's time to get desperate. Let's, on, let's be on fire for revelation. Let's be on fire to see the promised son be born in us. Hey, man, the, the musician can go ahead and come, and I'm going to try to wind it up right there. Because, look, we talk about making a stand. Making a stand, you need to do this. Listen to this kind of music. Don't listen to that kind of music. Do that. Dress this kind of way. Take a stand for the gospel. This is the way that you should be doing. But you can't do that until God calls you. Otherwise, it's just obeying, what, obeying a set of rules, obeying a set of rules that your mom and daddy have set for you, obeying a set of rules that your, your pastor or whoever has set for you. But when God comes down and begins to speak to your heart, then it becomes a living reality. It becomes something that God moving on the inside, and he gives you, he gives you something to stand with. But until you get that, Ephesians 4.13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able, to be, be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. 
See, you do everything that you can to stand. You do everything that you can do to stand. You do all that you can to stand. And then God will take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. You believe that tonight? Amen. Let's stand on our feet and just, and, and just worship him for a little bit. <clears throat> Go ahead, brother. Page 214 in Sparrow Blue. The windows of heaven are open. Amen, they are on The blessings are falling tonight. Oh, there's joy, joy, joy in my heart. For Jesus makes everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. Sit the down, blessings right are falling tonight. For this joy, joy, joy in my heart. For Jesus makes everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. And I'm feasting today on the meadow. Going, bro. We're all falling tonight for this joy, joy, joy in my heart. For Jesus makes everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white, and I'm feasting today on the meadow. That's why I'm happy tonight. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. For there's joy, joy, joy in my heart. For Jesus makes everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me I'm feasting today on the manor, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Amen. What an exchange to give him your old tattered garments, and he gives you a robe of pure white. Not because, of, not because of any of your merits, not because of anything that you had done, but only by his grace. Praise the Lord. Well, all hearts and minds clear? Everybody feeling good? Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. That's right. Remember that uh, there's cake downstairs and things. So remember that. Don't, don't go running off. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we're so grateful to you today for another day, Lord Jesus. Lord God, to, 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 to rejoice, Lord, and that we've risen up from the muck and the mire and the things of this world to, to bask in the light of the sun, Lord Jesus. Lord, that should make every believer so happy, Lord God, to be able to look into the light of your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful to you, Lord. I pray, oh God, as, as everyone leaves the building this evening, Lord God, that they'll go with a song in their heart and a spring in their step, Lord Jesus, knowing, Lord God, that you're with them, that you've spoken to them, that you've called them, Lord Jesus, that you're going with them on the road home, Lord, and that you'll be with them in the coming week, Lord. We just thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your grace to us, Lord Jesus. A, a people who were lost, Lord God, but you saved us. A people who didn't, who didn't know anything about you, Lord God, but you gave us understanding and knowledge and wisdom to know about you. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace and mercy. Now, go with your people, Lord Jesus. Be with Brother Michael and all these young ones, Lord Jesus. If we, we celebrate this little graduation, Lord God. Lord, be with Brother Wade and, and Brother Dale and them, Lord, and, and gr grant it, Lord, that you'll give them traveling mercies and grace, Lord Jesus, on this little vacation and time of rest. And be with them, we pray. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
you're dismissed.